Hi everyone, Jennifer Blevins-Smith with Integral Clinic Solutions, and you're watching my YouTube channel, Navigating the Business of Medicine. Today, I want to talk about credentialing denials. I do get asked this question quite often about how to handle a situation when an insurance denies credentialing a provider for a certain reason. Remember from my other videos that credentialing is specifically for individual providers. There will be situations where you'll find some insurance companies where they will say, you need to credential the facility, but that's not very common. Usually credentialing is referred to the individual provider. And there is a lot of information that the insurance companies require to obtain from a provider in order to make sure that they are a good fit to bring on to their network, to make sure that they are going to not be a high risk provider, like putting them in any kind of liability situation, if you will, and just to, to vet them, to ensure that they are the right fit for being included in their network because they are going to trust these providers with the lives of their beneficiaries with the patients and they don't want to be held liable if they bring someone on and they're not good they do things that are not trustworthy they're dangerous whatever the fact may be so i personally have never experienced where an insurance company has denied a provider individually for their credentialing information i have never had a reason for a provider to not be accepted into a network. I have, however, experienced where the insurance will say we're closed from accepting any new providers in a certain specialty, like our panel is closed, it's not accepting, or that they're not accepting any new groups, stuff like that. That has nothing to do usually with the individual provider or the group, the new group. It has to do with how many people they already have on their panels in their network in a specific geographical location that is related to this provider or the group. And then how many in that specialty in the geographic location in their network and they don't want to have too many so sometimes they will close the panel and in that situation you would want to make sure that you express to the insurance company what would benefit them for bringing on this individual provider to their network is there a certain subspecialty that they have that maybe they just see dermatologists but they don't see it's a mohs surgeon dermatologist or maybe they only see that it's a surgeon but they don't see it's a brain surgeon or something like that and it's something that is rare or something that's needed and in that situation you would need to write a letter to whomever would need to receive it and you can find out from contacting the insurance company who to address this letter to and you would express why it would benefit the insurance company and the patients, their beneficiaries, for accepting you in their closed panel. Again, it has to be something pretty unique. It has to be a subspecialty that's hard to find or some kind of um, service that's offered that other places competitors don't often do, things like that, because that's what's going to set you aside and them to go, oh, geez, they make a good point. We don't have anybody or we only have one person that does this and they have a really long line and waiting list for people to get in. So maybe we should accept this person because even though they're a dermatologist, they do MOs and we need more people to be able to do the MOs for our patients, our beneficiaries. So yes, Yes, we'll go ahead and make an exception. Again, it can't just be because you're special or, you know, <laughs> I don't, I, it has to be something pretty unique. Maybe you speak a language that's very rare for a lot of people to know, but you have a high population in the area that speaks that language and patients would like that. 
that could be another angle. You really have to use it to your advantage, but you have to think outside the box. It's not a guarantee that they would make the exception and accept you into the network, but it, you definitely can at least give it a try. You can also see if they have an anticipated date when they think they will be opening the panel again or how that situation works at that insurance company. Is it once they have providers who retire that they backfill that position? Is it that it's just a temporary close for right now for them to assess the situation and then they might reopen it? When to check back? Who to speak with about it? I mean, there's all these other questions that even though you get a denial, it doesn't mean that you have to quote, accept it right away. You can ask the questions, you can try to appeal it, um, it's all about being professional and explaining to them how they would benefit, right? Play that game of showing them how their beneficiaries and their insurance company would benefit from having this provider on their panel. Now, there's also situations like I kind of mentioned where groups might not be accepted, but the individual providers are accepted. And in that situation, it's kind of a different situation that you would have to discuss internally on how you want to do this, because as a group, you should be billing as a group, the group tax ID, group MPI. But if one of your providers is already credentialed with them, and they could possibly bill under their own social security number as a sole proprietor in MPI-1, and it's something that you really want to be able to offer to patients, that's something you would need to talk about internally, if it's worth it, if your billing system can do a setup specifically for that kind of situation, your staff would have to be aware of it from your front office staff to your billing staff. Um, it could be kind of complex and difficult. There could be a lot of errors and issues that could arrive from that. But depending on the need and the niche and the rarity of whatever that provider is doing for certain patients, it might be worth it. So the risk versus reward would have to be looked at very closely and discussed and to see if it would be possible. And then essentially that provider would be billing under themselves as a sole proprietor. Uh, they might have to get like their own business license or whatever to be able to be recognized. Um, and then there would have to be maybe some kind of agreement with the group that if they see patients for that specific service uh, with patients with that specific insurance only and some kind of financial, you know, workout, a, 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 agreement. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, like I said there. There's a business side, there's an operation side, there's a billing side. Um, but if it's something that is a niche for this provider that they offer that can really help patients and the insurance isn't willing to still bring on the group, but the provider is credentialed and you guys want to be able to offer it to patients who really need it and it's not gonna be a super common thing, then it might be worth it. But again, every situation is different and it's something that would need to be discussed and thoroughly planned out and executed before you could do it. If you have any questions or comments about this, please leave that in the comments below. Smash the thumbs up button if today's video was helpful. Subscribe to my channel if you have not already, and please share this video with your colleagues. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.